the situation has now changed. The, the attitude of the nation state toward drugs, which you, is that you regulate their flow into a society in order to control sedation and the generation of revolutionary political agendas and so forth and so on, and that you use them as a back channel source of black money, the nation state is now on the ropes. It's being replaced by the by something else, the world's Fortune 1000 companies, the world corporate state. It's a similar situation to what happened at the Thirty Years' War, where the Thirty Years' War was from 1619 to 48, and at the beginning, Europe was ruled by popes and kings. At the end, it was ruled by peoples and parliaments. And the church had been basically told, you can have an acre of land in the center of every village, uh, but the money, the big stuff, the major rackets of European civilization, we will now reserve to ourselves. You bury the dead, feed the hungry, run hospitals and insane asylums, print books, and we'll take care of the money-making stuff. This is now happening to the nation-state. The nation state is being told, your agenda is now obsolete. You provide health care, build highways, and uh, we'll take over the money-making end of civilization. And the attitude of the world corporate state is a little different than the attitude of the, of the nation state. First of all, the world corporate state hates unregulated markets. It, it just simply doesn't like unregulated markets. And to it, drugs are a commodity. It dealt opium in the 19th century. It dealt spices in the 15th century. It dealt sugar, tobacco, and rum in the 17th century. Uh, it hates unregulated markets. Uh, so I... And it also is more interested in drugs as sources of entertainment than social control. The interesting thing about the world corporate state is it has no real moral agenda. It only wants to pick your pocket, which when you think of what's been peddled in the ideological marketplace in the 20th century, somebody who simply wants to pick your pocket is a welcome and humane addition to the rogues gallery. So I would think that uh, fairly quickly, more and more drugs will be legalized, uh, and uh, and even drug taking encouraged, uh, because there's a great deal of money to be made. I think that the way that it will be done on a cost benefit basis, and if you're trying to minimize the amount of social money you spend on drug-induced damage control without any recourse to humane rhetoric at all, the way to do it is to, de is to decide that all forms of drug abuse are mental illnesses. And then you don't build prisons and mess with people like that. You simply give them therapies of various sorts paid for by insurance companies and governments. And the cost of this, compared to treating these things as criminal enterprises, is uh, one-tenth to one-twentieth. Uh, and strangely enough, it's one of those weird situations where this is probably what should be done from a moral point of view as well, but it'll be done for all the wrong reasons. Uh, after all, I mean, think of somebody who has some rare disease which you've heard of, but other than that, know nothing of. Well, their problem impacts on your life approximately as much as a 2CBT2 abuse, which must also wreck a few lives somewhere out there in the six billion of us on the planet. So all these things should just be treated as neurotic responses to the problem of being and if people want therapy or want antidepressants or whatever they want to get over this hump, it should be given to them. But to, to criminalize it is not to uh, do any favor to the victim. It's simply to turn it into a racket for all kinds of uh, 
of underworld and, and marginal institutions. I think people will be allowed to uh, self-select their drugs. And, you know, the consequences of over-sedating yourself is lack of uh, economic advancement. And this will be so evidently the shining god of all social strategies that very few people, I think, will choose it. I mean, in other words, I don't hold the opinion that if heroin were a dollar a gram, half the world's population would addict to heroin. I think that's a, a scary notion that the right wing has propagated. It goes along with man's fall and the Oedipal complex and, uh, you know, a few other of these man is man's worst enemy kind of rhetoric. If that's true, we're doomed anyway, so we just might as well pack it in. Yeah. Corporate condition. Cultural condition. Well, DMT is a short-acting, dramatically active psychedelic that's smoked. LSD is a long-acting, dramatically active psychedelic that's ingested, that's a quasi-synthetic compound. Psilocybin is an alkaloid found in numerous mushroom species that's a medium-range psychedelic in its activity. And what all these things have in common is that without any great danger to body and mind, they produce a profound transformation of consciousness, the, pro the processing of language, the way in which we model the world and relate to the past. Uh, and do they impact on cultural conditioning? You bet your booties they do, because what they do essentially is return you to some primal pre-cultural state of conditioning where the animal body and the unacculturated inputs of perception are directly experienced. I mean, this is a model of the psychedelic experience. Somebody else might say that's bunkum, that's not what it does at all. But in my opinion, that's what it does, that culture is some kind of hallucination. It's a shared, associationally driven linguistic malaise that until recently was geologically confined and created by cultural forces, and now, of course, in the era of the 747, with these languages and language domains are spread around the world. And it creates a kind of metaculture. But culture is the clothing that you wear over the otherwise naked human psyche. In other words, you know, in a given culture, one doesn't fart in public situations. That's a cultural value. That's not something inherent in the programming of the human body. We have the option to fart or not to fart. Another example would be polygamy versus monogamy. Those are cultural choices, but obviously the vast amount of experience of other cultures shows us that people can do it one way or another way or another way. Is culture good or bad? Well, I'm coming slowly to the conclusion that it's a, I'm not sure it's bad, but it's certainly a damn nuisance. It's a limitation, is what it is. It's like, you know, when you go to, I don't know, pick a country, it doesn't matter, Denmark, Germany, Russia, Korea, and you notice everybody behaves in a certain way, not because they have to, but because they choose to, because it's been culturally modeled for them with such force that uh, the path of least resistance seems to fall that way. But the problem is these cultures create less than a full expression of human potential. I would almost be willing to say they interrupt the unfolding of full human potential and put in its place an infantile, self-indulgent, potentially neurotic, uh, unresolved human being. And you know, the more somebody is a part of their culture, the more parody they are. 
of themselves. So that an Archie Bunker, for example, you know, gets a laugh from everybody because he is a paradigm and a parody of limited cultural values. A person who really thought no deeper than an Archie Bunker is not really a person at all. Well, so then this leads to the interesting perception that to the degree we are integrated into our culture, we are not ourselves. And uh, uh, to my mind, that's, if true, news that must be acted upon. You can't just sit with that. Then you say, well, so culture is the enemy. And the deconstruction of culture and the uh, individuation of the self are, in fact, the same project, the same agenda. And uh, I think that's true. Uh, and then why psychedelics? Well, because they are simply more effective than any other known method. I mean, we have two methods, two other methods at our disposal. One would be like meditation slash yoga, etc., etc. But notice that what that is, is just reacculturation to a different cultural vocabulary and value system. Uh, that's not going to work either. So, uh, you know, and people say, well, what's, where are you coming from with this? Well, might as well admit it. I'm, I'm some kind of an anarchist. You know, in the common imagination, anarchy is somehow bankrupt because it's thought that when you talk of anarchy, you always mean political anarchy, and that obviously wouldn't work because man is a brute, a nasty, brutish, and short, etc., etc. I'm not a political anarchist. I'm more like a philosophical anarchist. But I think we are freest to be ourselves uh, when culture messes with us the least. And, uh, and culture messes with us a lot. We are its slaves, you know. I mean, we work in the industries and businesses. It defines. We then take our hard-earned money and spend it on the choices which it offers. And if anybody raises their hand against this, well, then they're called a dissenter, a maladaptive, and if you get too obstreperous about it, they drop a net over you and either call you a criminal or a madman and take you away. I mean, funny that we drifted this direction today, but uh, to the fact that the world seems to be reaching some kind of boiling point. Well, I've always felt that the progress of the individual personality or psyche toward completion was probably a fractal subset of society's effort to order its agenda and its house. And, uh, you know, part of the, part of the consequence of the existence of mass media is that everything that's going on in the world ends up confined in the pages of something like this. Uh, we're, the old order is not going quietly. And in the most benighted parts of the world, and certainly India and Pakistan qualify as benighted parts of the world, the new corporate agenda hasn't yet asserted itself. This is very old-style stuff, this Pakistan-India stuff. Uh, corporations, whatever their flaws, they do not launch thermonuclear strikes against their rivals or their rivals' markets. Uh, I, you know, it's remarkable that having possessed nuclear weapons for nearly 60 years or 55 years, they were only used once against civilian populations or even inhabited targets. Uh, I, I think that essentially law and order is being extended to the outlaw parts of the world. And what's going on in India and Pakistan is outlaw stuff. 
and I'm sure behind the scenes uh, they're being manipulated and pulled into line. Uh, the situation a couple of months ago in Indonesia was instructive in this regard. Apparently how it's thought of in Brussels and London and New York is if you're one of these third world countries, you can operate any kind of economy you want. You can have any kind of squirrely banking system and investment policy and whatever. You can do it however you want until you get in trouble. And when you get in trouble, these guys come from the World Bank and the IMF. They just fly in on 747s with briefcases. And it's worse than losing a war. Because when you lose a war, if you do it right, you get to negotiate some kind of peace treaty with International Monetary Fund. With the IMF and the World Bank, you do not get to negotiate. They come in and they say, uh, here is your labor policy. We suggest you devalue your currency to this degree. Here is the bank restructuring plan for you. Here are the cuts we suggest you immediately implement in your public service sector. And they basically say, and if you don't do these things, we're going to cancel your credit and hurl you back to the Stone Age. And uh, these countries fall into line. They have no choice. I mean, Korea, they were having a presidential election. Both candidates denounced the IMF austerity proposal, and within 48 hours, both candidates had reversed themselves. This tells you, you know, real hammers are being thrown around in these boardrooms. So, uh, no, war, I mean, people have this fantasy that, that world capitalism is profiting from the arms race and so forth and so on. A sector of world capitalism is profiting from the arms race, but it's a dinosaur sector of it. The world corporate state doesn't like the busting up of infrastructure. I mean, what are millions of hungry refugees to the world corporate state except exactly the kind of problem they want to hand on to government? Say, you know, these people aren't shopping in malls. They're not working in bauxite factories. They're standing around with rickets with their hand out for a bowl of rice. Exactly the sort of thing we don't like to see. So uh, I think the world corporate state is much more interested in having people hard at work with middle a with middle class aspirations that can be endlessly met by a consumer electronics marketplace of infinite extent, um, and and they will they don't make war on people with the bombs and guns and tanks. They narcoticize people through media. It's the new hard hard edge solid state way of stealing your soul. And war is very bad. It makes political waves. It polarizes people. It creates very bad TV. And, uh, and it's very hard to do dirty, ugly things in the world now because the images are, are pushed all over the world. So, you know, like this thing in, in the former Yugoslavia and all that, uh, these images have made these people's name mud throughout the world. And the, the, in many cases, the ferocity of the conflict, I think, in horrible as it's been, has been held down by the threat of these images going everywhere and what this means in terms of business and banking and tourism and capital investment. Mm, good question. I think the thing is that capitalism, the intelligence of the capitalist organism is approximately that of a flatworm. And everything you said I agree with. What is the agenda of world capitalism since capitalism has always depended to work on a frontier of cheap labor and exploitable natural resources being fabricated into high-value goods, which are then sold to a core population of well of the wealthy bourgeoisie. 
how can that cycle be continued in the face of dwindling world resources? The answer is it can. So capitalism itself is uh, self-limiting. Well, there are different kinds of capitalism. America practices the most virulent form of slash and burn, take no prisoner capitalism. Uh, a few years ago, we had a virtual reality conference here at Esalen, and some executives from Fujitsu came. And in the course of their presentation, they realized that Fuji they revealed to us that Fujitsu has a committee and the committee is in charge of the 500-year plan for the corporation. They have a 500-year plan for the Fujitsu Corporation. Well, now, your first inclination is to smile. And it is a foolish idea. Obviously, uh, the world will be a very different place in 500 years. But still, it shows an attitude. It shows a way of thinking about resources that we need to emulate. Capitalism may be able to reinvent itself as a more intelligent animal, or it may be able to break out of the planetary cycle of limited resources and return extraterrestrial material to the Earth. In other words, you can imagine a capitalism where the, low, where the proletarian classes were actually machines. And the and the these machines would be operating off world, and a steady stream of more refined material was being brought into Earth orbit and fabricated for a human ruler class. I don't think anything like that will happen because I think the evolutionary rate at which these machines are complexifying makes it highly unlikely that they will be taking orders from human beings very much longer. In fact, the main hope is that we don't have to take orders from them uh, very soon. But the, the capitalism thing, there are several other possible scenarios that might keep the poker game going a few hands longer. One is uh, light is an endlessly exploitable resource. Part of the problem may be that capitalism deals too many things things when what it should actually deal are images of things. In other words, could it go virtual? Could we end up spending most of our disposable income on code rather than fabricated steel, aluminum, glass, and plastic? If the codes were beguiling enough, gave you beautiful interiors, splendid companionship, tremendous educational experiences, and so forth, uh, we would buy it. I mean, capitalism on the internet is obviously trying to train people to accept the idea that code is worth money, that data uh, is everything. So uh, that's one possibility. Another possibility, slightly more long term, is, uh, and some people are keen for this, I'm skeptical because anything that's never happened yet, I would tend to bet against. But some people think you could bring on nanotechnology and essentially make everything for free. Of course, the question would then be, what would anybody's motivation for creating it be? The holy grail of nanotech is a device called a matter compiler. What is a matter compiler? It's something that has seawater or river delta sludge running through it. And it does to matter what Photoshop 5.0 does to images. Anything you want uh, would be built from the atoms up by machines. The nanotech enthusiasts talk about we could abandon agriculture within 20 years. The price of abandoning agriculture would be that China would eat its rice out of machines. Seawater would be converted directly into rice by nanotechnology. Well, are we for this or against this? Is this an appalling idea, being able to end agriculture and reforest uh, billions of acres of land, but at the price of further artificializing and making even more synthetic the food supply the world population depends on? It's interesting how these things always occur in these hellish dichotomies uh, uh, 
the search for ever greater naturalism produces situations of ever greater compacted synthetic culture. Um, my faith is that none of these problems will ever reach the levels of, you know, catastrophic contradiction because the very context in which the whole thing is formed is constantly changing. In other words, new inventions, new possibilities, uh, rewrite the equation and you never quite reach the black hole implied by this problem or that problem. We always seem to engineer our way around it. But that probably can't go on forever. Well, this is nanotech. If nanotech came on, we would never have to dig another ounce of gold or another ounce of aluminum or another ounce of molybdenum. So that means we're making a more efficient use of copper. Yeah, the other thing is, you know, nanotechnology would take the most appalling consequence of the industrial era, which is toxified land and uh, waste dump storages and stuff like that. That's where the money is. For a nanotechnological world, those are the most desirable pieces of real estate on the planet because you engineer bacteria and nano machines that burrow into that stuff and stack it up for you and then you have all the platinum beryllium etc etc you could ever possibly need it all lies in the the middens of the industrial age it it's far i mean it uh, five years ago, which is a thousand years ago in technological development, uh, Scientific American had a cover which showed a one centimeter chip and it had 1500 steam engines on it. Each, uh, more steam engines than were operating in England at the height of the age of steam. Of course, each steam engine produced one ten thousandth of a millinewton of force, basically enough force to kick a water molecule a couple of angstroms down the track. But uh, the idea of nanotechnology is that we should build as nature builds at the molecular level, seamlessly using long chain polymers and RNA-like transcription machines to gather raw molecular materials out of the environment and, and everything could be fabricated at low temperature out of uh, seawater or river estuaries or something like that. Uh, how far are they? Well, if you go online and search nanotechnology, you see this is a burgeoning field, vast profits to be made, and there are breakthroughs happening weekly uh, in laboratories around the world. Because if we can't get a control of our political agenda, meaning our population policies and stuff like that, then it, it is going to be nanotechnology or it's going to be back to the wall. There aren't very many other choices. I mean, it's a fantasy to think that we're going to offload people on Mars or something. I mean, you would have to have 20 thousand people a day leaving the earth just to keep the population constant. So it's going to be technology or catastrophe or fascism. These are the choices because of course fascism, you know, can just order the liquidation of everybody under five feet or everybody with brown eyes or whatever and, you know, but the, the, the consequences of fascism are the complete distortion and subjugation of the human spirit. When we talk about survival of the human species, we're not talking about at any cost or under any circumstances. If humanness does not survive with the human species, then we're no more than another cannibal ape with a, a bigger club in the hand. The glitch. The Y to K problem. I find it fascinating. I want to. It's sort of like the objection I had to crop circles 
when people started telling me about crop circles, the first question I asked was, I said, well, NATO has these huge atomic weapons depots all across southern England, forward basing for NATO strategic nuclear weaponry. What does the British defense establishment think of the funny shapes appearing in the wheat field on the other side of the fence? They must go berserk over this, because if you can crush a pattern in the wheat, you can certainly throw switches on an atomic weapon depot. And the British military establishment treated truck crop circles like a joke, which caused me to undertake to believe they probably were a joke. So the Y to K thing, here we are, none of us probably own hundred million dollar corporations. We're worrying about Y to K. Are they worried in the boardrooms? They're not worried enough. They're budgeting for contingency. They're making some kind of effort to clean up some of the code. But if they believed the rhetoric that I see on the Internet, then they would have declared martial law 18 months ago. Every Fortran programmer on the planet would have been told to report to the nearest army base. Uh, they would have pulled everybody off of their industry consulting jobs and told them, you know, you will save the air traffic control systems. You will save the electrical grid. Anybody who violates these orders, a bullet in the head. Well, that's the corporate agenda. But, you know, the, the, the Bill Clinton is sworn to preserve and protect the general welfare of the United States. Not so to do is a more serious impeachable offense than a blowjob from a secretary. Uh, if the government does not at some point begin to react to the Y to K problem, you will have to conclude they must have deep intelligence which tells them that uh, it's, it's a sustainable hit. Because otherwise, in the aftermath of a complete pull down of the electrical grid, meltdown of the air traffic control system, collapse of the banking and credit system, and so forth and so on, these people would be hunted like dogs through the streets by angry mobs. Uh, they don't want that. So I think that as we approach January 31st, 1999, I mean December 31st, 1999, uh, there will be rollover dates. There will be many Y2K problems. Like, you know, a number of states, including New York State, budget on a two-year budget, not a one-year budget. Well, what happens on these rollover dates? They're like little confined experimental modules of the real thing. Um, it's a fascinating problem. And if you go with the chicken little position that, you know, it's going to pull down the electrical grid, it's never coming back, the financial system is going to completely collapse, the world trade and inventory control system is going to go down, everything is going to go down, and it will not be three weeks or six months or three years or 30 years before we recover, but it'll be, you know, 120 years or something like that. If you believe those people, then it's a delightful idea that, because, you know, it didn't take flying saucers coming from Zanebo Ganubi, no geomagnetic reversal of the poles, no coming of the third person of the Trinity, no deep impact of a planetesimal body, just a 30-year-old Fortran fuck-up uh, <laughs> brings the entire system down. It's almost too good to be true. Uh, it, I, I just, I don't know. Maybe I'm so sanguine because I'm pretty well positioned personally <laughs> to take the hit. I mean, I live in Hawaii on an island, off-grid, with a wireless connection to the internet, with a big garden, and so uh, all that would happen for me would be a very complex news story would be hard to follow. <laughs> but when I think of my friends in lower Manhattan, picturing that, you cannot picture that. Too many things 
are happening at once. You know, you can imagine the air traffic system failing, but you can't imagine the electrical grid and the natural gas and the and 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 I mean it begins to cascade and you know if something gets broken on a large scale in society you can fix it like you have an atomic power plant blow up or you have a hurricane wipe out a city or you have some toxic spill or something you can always respond to these things and get back to equilibrium but if you have a hundred of these things happen at once the very fabric of response is rent and then it's a free-for-all you know when the fire department can't get to the fire when the nobody when nothing works uh, be very interesting the thing I'm watching is the stock market I mean the stock market is within two or three percent of the highest values it's ever been at if world ca capitalism is about to take this enormous hit at some point they will begin to liquefy and pull back and the stock market should fall a thousand points or more well before we get to the actual crisis date and in fact the stock market has been incredibly robust in the face of the problems in Asia and so forth and so on so I think it's a thing to be aware of if nothing happens when it all when the day comes I think we should keep track of the chicken littles of this movement and invite them back on the stage. Uh, you know, we're accustomed to apocalyptic hysteria from people who talk to archangels, from people who are in touch with the high priesthood of high Atlantis, from people who, you know, get their news from Sidonia and uh, locations further east. But we're not accustomed to apocalyptic hysteria from guys with pen protectors who are uh, bottom liners. And in a way, this Y to K thing, it's permission for them to join the party. Uh, they too now can have something to be totally hyped up and excited about. And they are doing it with the enthusiasm not outdone by in friends of the Arantia cult or uh, Nostradamus or anybody else. It's amazing, once you have a reason to believe the world is ending, how absolutely irresistible the conclusion is. Uh, <laughs> so, I think that's enough for today. Uh, if you found this interesting, come again. If you didn't, don't come again. Tell your friends in any case. Tomorrow we'll be at Watts from 6 to 8. And Thursday. Thursday, Thursday not tomorrow. Thank you. 8 to 10. What did I say? 6 to 8. 8 to 10, Watts, Thursday. And uh, thank you all for showing up. If this wasn't what you expected, most things aren't, are they? <laughs>